Hey there students, Tom Ritchie here and here for the second broadcast on our Bill of Rights Institute AP Preparedness Series. And it's a pleasure to be here. I'm just uh, here teaching from home. Y'all are learning from home this week. So I'm glad to be a part of this. Uh, this whole thing. So this is going to be uh, this is going to be an adventure. I mean, I just hadn't even brushed my hair today. So, uh, you know, getting used to the home life. And let's remember now, of course, tomorrow we are set to get a major announcement from the college board about AP exams and how the coronavirus situation has uh, influenced that. So we'll wait till tomorrow to hear what they have to say. But for right now, we'll continue to prepare. And it certainly can't hurt us to review. And the focus of this uh, of this lesson will be on the American Revolution. Okay, so we see here that um, you know, so somebody's using the uh, the British thing, you know, the American War for Independence, which is maybe more of a uh, you know of an international way of looking at that. Was it really a revolution? Okay, that's that's an interesting question, Justin. And Justin, I'm trying to figure out if there's a code for what you put here in the comments where you've got numbers after the Stamp Act and the Quartering Act and the T Act. I'd love to figure that out. Now, as far as that goes, when we think about a revolution, there are two types of revolutions. There are political revolutions and social revolutions. Now, political revolutions are revolutions that change the government. Like if something's a purely political revolution, then it resulted in a change in government. If it is a social revolution, then it is resulting in a change in society as well as a change in government, that it's focusing on that. Now, I would not dismiss the American Revolution as purely a political revolution. Now, of course, we can say that, you know, the elites on, you know, the elites in North America were pretty much before and after the same elites. So you see where you've got the same people up top. But one thing that you want to think about, uh, and this is, I'm really focusing more on the causes of the American Revolution, but it wouldn't necessarily be a bad idea to examine the effects of the American Revolution again. Okay, so as far as that goes, this is something that I, this is a lecture I haven't put on my YouTube channel yet, but I'm going to go ahead and show a little something because that seems to be what y'all are concerned about. So let's go and do this. I mean, after all, as I say, this isn't Harry Potter. It's not a history. Uh, it's it's not, well, it's a history. It's just not a mystery novel, right? And so when we look at this, when I look at the legacies of the American Revolution, you know, a lot of people ask about that. What difference did the American Revolution make? Did it really change anything? And one thing that I think is worth noting is if we look at Thomas Jefferson in Britain in 1786, notice how Thomas Jefferson has got the powdered wig, okay? So when we look at this, you know, we can take a close up here of Thomas Jefferson in his powdered wig, that he is an aristocrat and he's dressed in that uh, in that style. And this is immediately after the American Revolution, but let's take a look here when you've got Thomas Jefferson in 1791, only five years later in the United States. So the thing is, we, we don't want to dismiss this as just a political revolution revolution when we see somebody like Jefferson notice uh, you know that he's got uh, just his natural hair he shed the powdered wig he doesn't want you know the elites no longer want to look like aristocrats, even if they are, okay? I mean, Jefferson was, uh, you know, was undoubtedly an aristocrat. Now, of course, another thing that we see is this concept of republicanism. And that's something that did not really exist under the British, uh, under the British system, that the colonies were part of a monarchy. Uh, they, uh, they swore allegiance to the king. And that's something that in a republic, we don't see. So I think that there's more to just a change in the form of government. Now, we also want to note when we look at the effects of the American Revolution, that north of the Mason-Dixon line, we see uh, gradual emancipation laws, that we see that slavery is on its way out. And this is actually 
before this was happening in European countries. So we start to see already some changes here. Now, on the other hand, we do see that slavery became more entrenched in the South, but you know, this is more about economics than it is about the values of the revolution. But I don't think we should ignore the effects there that we see that states, uh, you know, that every state, I mean, New Jersey eventually joins the other states from north of the Mason-Dixon line in passing gradual emancipation laws. So I think that that is an effect. Now, we also could look at Thomas Jefferson's Virginia statute for religious freedom. And so we see here that the Anglican church was disestablished in Virginia. So that's something when we look at our constitution and the first amendment that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. And this is dealing with something that we have already seen in other places. You think about, uh, you know, what, what, Sorry, I've been broadcasting all day. That, pro that sentence probably didn't make any sense. But we have, we're doing something now that we didn't see in Britain at the time, that before the American Revolution, the Church of England was established in most colonies. And of course, uh, you know, in Britain today, the Church of England is still technically established, even though it doesn't really have a role in the government. But it wasn't until the 1820s that the British repealed the Test Acts, which got rid of the requirement to hold office that you be a professing Anglican um, who takes communion in the Anglican Church. Uh, in the U.S. Constitution, it said that there will be no religious test required for office. So I think that when we look at the separation of church and state, uh, you know, that is something that is a consequence of the American Revolution. So that's something that we could look in um, on that. Um, and so, you know, while we don't see necessarily like women's suffrage, remember that Abigail Adams told her husband, remember the ladies, John Adams, uh, we want to participate in here, but you don't necessarily see a, you know, women voting, but at the same time, you are going to see that women are going to uh, be responsible for raising their for raising their children to be good Republican citizens, this whole idea of Republican motherhood. Now, not Sarah Palin kind of Republican. That's something, you know, those of you in high school probably don't even remember her. I'll probably need to uh, update this a little bit uh, for your audiences. So that's something I think that's important here. Um, of course, Jefferson's, uh, you know, Je the Jefferson and others, how they, you know, this idea of an agrarian Republican public um, as the ideal, you know, these are some things that I think are worth noting. And again, with Jefferson, when you go to the Jefferson Memorial, uh, when you see that Jefferson is standing there in, you know, with his own hair, not a powdered wig, right? And he's standing there in a coat that's not an especially dressy coat. Now, in today's terms, Jefferson is, uh, you know, Jefferson could be seen as a bit dressy, but in those terms, uh, I don't think that we're necessarily, uh, you know, see, you know, people wouldn't have interpreted this as super dressy. Uh, from what I can see, it looks kind of like his Lewis and Clark coat that he was fond of wearing. That's really like more like wild man Jefferson. Um, also, George Washington, when we look at statues of George Washington, he is portraying himself as something of a simple farmer. Like here's a an 1840 portrayal of George Washington. And this is something that's not very Republican. This is not, you know, George Washington didn't tell his own sculptor, I want to be sculpted with abs and I want to look like a god. Uh, George, this was really not very well received by the American public because it did not put out republicanism. And now when I say republicanism, no, I don't mean the Republican Party. I mean republicanism in the sense that we are all Republicans, that we all believe in a Republican form of government uh, where the government's power comes from the people who are governed by their representatives. Now, Washington, Notice here, he didn't want to be idealized. Look at him with his uh, with his beer belly here. Uh, you know, he's just a little bit paunchy. He's not trying, you know, he didn't tell the sculptor like, hey, uh, you know, why don't you make me a little bit more trim, okay? That we start to see that this idea also of Washington as an American Cincinnatus going back to the Roman Republic and using these Roman Republican officials um, who gave away 
power. There's the statue of Cincinnati in Cincinnati, Ohio, who is giving his power away um, before he had to. And then we see similarly Washington with the same pose here where Washington is giving his power away, that he's giving his commission back to the Continental Congress and saying, you know, by this time, I guess the Confederation Congress and saying that, you know, I am, I do not need to be in power forever. George Washington also stepped down after two terms. So we see this Republican idea against small r of rotation in office that there doesn't need to be, even though the Constitution didn't limit the term of the president, terms of the president, George Washington said, I am self-limiting my presidential tenure because that is the right thing to do under principles of republicanism. So when you consider that, uh, you know, we definitely see that there is something of a mindset change um, when we go, you know, when we look and we see that, you know, is something changing other than the people in charge? Uh, James, I will uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good observation, uh, you know, Bobby, that, that Washington is being sculpted a bit thick, okay? And so, yeah, so basically what we're going to do uh, after the streams are over, things that I refer to will be put in the description. So this is going to remain on the Bill of Rights Institute's uh, YouTube channel, and you will be able to see this, okay? But one thing that we want to note is that when we think about the revolution, okay, the American revolution, revolution and thinking about cause and effect. Um, when we ask questions like, you know, evaluate the extent to which the American Revolution changed American society, that's something where we get into this, uh, this causation. So we think about the effects of this, okay? Now, Republicanism with a capital R versus Republicanism with a small r. Uh, what we want to think about here is when we when we use and this is you could you could see you know republicanism being you know spelled with a capital r but when i say small r republicanism i'm clarifying that this is not about the republican party okay i'm saying that this is basically you know kind of like when it comes down to it somebody who's a member of the republican party can believe in democracy okay they can believe in democracy somebody who's a democrat can believe in republicanism so that's something to uh, to note here that when we're talking about small r republicanism it's inclusive and it's not just about the republican party so with that when we look at the effects of the american revolution we could see something where you know we see a question that would ask us like an leq prompt could say something like evaluate the, what about all caps Republicanism? What about alternating caps and small letters like the SpongeBob memes Republicanism, right? Um, so as far as that goes, um, you know, we could see something where it would say evaluate the most significant effect of the American Revolution. And you would have to say, like, was it a change in government? Was it, you know, you could go in about Republicanism and how that changed the elites. Now, one other thing you see here is uh, that I didn't mention a second ago that I think maybe it would be um, a good idea to note is that they got rid of, there were some states that had um, what was called primogenitor. And primogenitor is when you allow the firstborn son to inherit. And so that's one thing that you see here that Southern states had had primogenitor laws that favored the firstborn sons, okay? And so states abolished these laws. So that's a little bit about the effects of the American Revolution. Now, keep in mind that I have, uh, you know, that I've got uh, videos where I go into the narrative of the causes of the American Revolution, and we definitely, uh, we definitely get into that. Um, but I'm going to be focusing now on, you know, some skills based stuff. Now, as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, we are, you know, now, now remember to ask your questions. Okay, so go ahead and ask your questions. And we will, uh, yeah, let's see if you've got questions asked, but let's go ahead and go into some of the causation of the American Revolution. Okay, so let's go into some of the causation.
and I will, uh, you know, kind of get into the road to the American Revolution. Now, if you've got, uh, if you've got questions, feel free to ask those. Michael says, bruh. All right, so let's go ahead and get into the road to the American Revolution. So when we're thinking about the causes, okay, and, and what we want to think about is what, uh, what would we do, let's go ahead and ask y'all first, if I were to ask about the causes of the American Revolution, what would you say would be the most important cause of the American Revolution? And we'll see what people have to say about that, okay? That we could, you know, just about any event, we can typically think of two or three causes. So going into that, uh, let's see, yeah, destroying no bill. Yeah, so that's, yeah, so when we look there that the Constitution prohibits the granting of titles of nobility by our government. Okay, so as far as uh, far as that stuff, okay, good to see you here, David. Glad to see that we've got uh, some people here. Yeah, so British taxation, definitely um, the taxation without representation is a key cause of the American Revolution. Okay, so that's the first thing that comes off of your across your mind. Now, also, let's talk about uh, you know besides taxation. What would be another thing? Okay, so you know when we're thinking about uh, taxation, we've got uh, some things here. Now, land, you know, the desire to move west. Now, one thing that I want to uh, that I want to just show off. I forgot to show y'all that I've got uh, I got some shirts for my broadcast uh, this week, and this one is uh, hand sanitizer and toilet paper. Uh, 2020. Okay, I just I found that on Amazon. Thought it was pretty funny. Uh, make sure y'all have washed your hands if you haven't lately. Okay, just make sure you're taking care of yourself, staying clean. Now, if we were going to uh, if we were going to go into uh, you know so salutary neglect, quartering soldiers. Okay, so that's something if we think about the military policy. Okay, so as far as that goes, yeah, the salutary neglect uh, that we see also when you see self-government. Okay, so when you see self-government, I think the shirt was like fifteen dollars on Amazon. I was like, I've just got to get that. Uh, you know, a year from now, I'll still wear, be wearing coronavirus t-shirts. Uh, people be, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how people look back at this uh, years from now. So. With that, you know, I would say that we've got taxation, we've got military policy. You know, we also have, uh, you know, when you when you consider uh, that the self government, as somebody said there. So let's go ahead and kind of think about how does some of this specific evidence support that? Okay, so let's think about how does some of this uh, specific evidence? Yeah, this is a uh, Clemson hat. So yeah, you can just go to uh, go to a Clemson Tigers uh, website and you'll be good. All right, so we are now screen sharing and let's go ahead driving on the left side of the road. That's great. Okay, so as far as that goes, I always like to start with the Declaration of Independence that, you know, where Jefferson writes, prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes and that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government. And so here's the thing that when we see Jefferson note this long train of abuses and usurpations, we need to give this some body, okay? So we can put this into three broad categories. Now I'm going, you know, another thing that's going to be linked later is I'm going to, I'm going to show you here um, that we've got you know, a potential LEQ, okay? So let's think about this in terms of what if we got something that said, evaluate the extent to which the American Revolution was caused by disputes over economic policy in the period from 1754 to 1776. And so typically when I'm thinking about the causes of the American Revolution, I'm thinking about economic policy and also I'm thinking about 
military policy. Okay, so so what we would do now if we want to just get three out of three, one thing we want to note, okay, some of y'all have different goals for um, what you're trying to do here. I've got several sample essays and I will definitely share these. Okay, so these will be shared in the description later on. Okay, so as far as that goes, if we wanted, I'm not going to worry about the two out of six, but if we were thinking about a three out of six, okay, and we see here, evaluate the extent to which the American Revolution was caused by disputes over economic policy in the period 1754 to 1776. Now, when we think about economic policy, that could be divided into two parts. We could look at taxes, and we could look at the regulation of trade. Okay, so with taxes, now, if I'm looking for a three out of six, now the average score is like a two point something, like on the LEQ. Um, it may come as a surprise to a lot of you, but if you do a three out of six, you're actually writing an above average LEQ, not a great LEQ by any means, but above average. Now, when we're constructing a thesis statement, we have to have, uh, you know, a we have to have a historically defensible thesis, and it has to be followed by a line of reasoning. Now, what that means is we usually need at least two supports for our argument. Okay. And this uh, is a type of thing. Now, we could do this as either causation or we could do this as possibly a continuity and change over time. I would prefer to approach it from a causation standpoint. So what I've done here is I have fragmented the disputes over economic policy into two categories, that we've got taxes and trade regulation. And so my thesis statement says here that disputes over economic policy played a major role in causing the American Revolution because colonists were upset about unfair taxes and their trade being regulated by the British. Okay, so we have here um, that a thesis is present. It makes a historically defensible claim. Okay, so disputes over economic policy played a major role in causing the American Revolution. Now, my line of reasoning is what starts with because. Okay, so because colonists were upset about unfair taxes and their trade being regulated by the British. Now, when we say historically defensible, um, then, you know, if we said disputes over economic policy played a major role in causing the American Revolution because southern states were upset about having their cotton trade regulated by the British, okay? That would be something that would sound like they've confounded the American Revolution and the American Civil War. So with this, you know, a thesis statement needs to be historically defensible, and then it needs to have some sort of line of reasoning, okay? Now, so this is basically, if you want to get a three out of six, now notice here what this essay is going to get. This essay is going to get thesis, specific examples, and historical reasoning, okay? So we, what we see here is that there's going to be a thesis statement. They've already gotten that point by writing one sentence. It's going to have specific examples and causal relationships are going to be examined. So we're going to see causation, okay? So with that in mind, we see here that we go into the first paragraph, all right? Now note that the first paragraph begins with a topic sentence, okay? And, you know, as far as that goes, it says here, it doesn't seem intentional. Um, the argument's more implicit, implicit and goes into a more narrative-driven argument. But we're going to see here that this person says, after the French and Indian War, Parliament passed new taxes that enforced mercantilism. The British wanted colonists to trade with only British ports, so they passed the Sugar Act, which it taxed imported sugar. Now, we have a piece of outside evidence here. It's not just that Parliament passed the Sugar Act. Now, if it had stopped there, that would not get you credit, okay? So you're going to have to know it taxed imported sugar. Parliament also passed the Stamp Act, which taxed documents. Colonists were upset about the Stamp Act because it was passed without their consent. They chanted no taxation without representation and boycotted British goods. This caused a lot of tension between Britain and its colonies. Okay, so we see here that we've got specific and relevant evidence. Okay, and so we see here that there is talk about the effect of the Stamp Act on the relationship between Britain and its American colonies.
So then we see here the Tea Act and the Boston Tea Party also cause problems between the colonists and the British. After the Boston Tea Party, Parliament passed the Intolerable Acts, which closed the Boston ports um, and brought more British troops into the colony. The colonists were very upset and convened the First Continental Congress. And so with that, um, you know, that we see here that there's specific and relevant evidence and it documents cause and effect, okay? Because what you're seeing here is because of the intolerable acts, okay? That the colonists were very upset they convened the first Continental Congress. Uh, now, this would probably be a little bit stronger if I noted like as a result, okay? That's something that I would say that for this essay to get the, you know, to get the point here um, for the, you know, it may be that we need a little bit more here for that uh, reasoning point, okay? But, um, you know, just a little bit more, we'll make sure that that's there, okay? So probably need a look, you know, looking at this again, I would probably be a little bit, I would probably put a little bit more cause and effect, but generally for that first reasoning point, it, the bar tends to be pretty low in the sense that it's not the complex understanding point, okay? So this essay is not going to get complex understanding. It's not gonna get contextualization and it's not uh, going to have, you know, you don't have strong enough evidence here to where it's like this evidence clearly supports the thesis. Okay, so I'm gonna show y'all a full credit uh, kind of thing here, okay? So, you know, now what exactly did salutary neglect end, okay? One thing that I would recommend to you would be a, uh, would be a video that I've got here, the French and Indian War as a turning point, okay? So I'm gonna run into YouTube real quick. I'm gonna give y'all a direct link to this video, okay? So going with that, let's see, uh, the French and Indian War, okay, so if you go down just a little bit, we're going to see the French and Indian War as a turning point, okay? So um, we'll have that, and let me go ahead and send that to uh, my contact here at the Bill of Rights Institute, and she can forward that to, uh, she can forward that to y'all, that this is going to be, you know, this is going to go into the French and Indian War. Now, let me go ahead then, and let's go in here and, you know, just kind of to give y'all a, you know, quick, you know, just so we're answering the question, because that goes into causation as well. All right, so the French and Indian War as a turning point. Okay, so going into that, and let me get the screen going again. And this, again, I've got a YouTube video that uh, meant that uh, goes into this uh, on a deeper level, but we want to make sure that, uh, you know, that, yeah, that we know that basically the French and Indian War gets all of this started, okay? So what we want to understand is the purpose of a colony is to make a profit for the mother country. So before the French and Indian War, the thing is the Navigation Acts were there, okay? The Navigate... The Navigation Acts were passed between 15, 1651 and 1663. But the thing is, what they said was that, uh, you know, British colonies had to trade with British ports or else they would pay a tax. And this is part of the policy of mercantilism where the trade policies were designed to discourage trade with other nations to give preference to British ports. Now, the thing is that before the French and Indian War, they were not in force. The British government's doing a see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil. And this is what we know as salutary neglect. Now, when you ask, what is salutary neglect? The example I always use is, let's say that, you know, your parents are going out of town for a weekend. I assume you're all in high school. You know, you're old enough to be left alone by yourself. And your parents say, you know what, we're going out of town. We're not going anywhere cool that you want to go. Um, so you're not missing out. And they leave a hundred dollar bill on the counter and they say, uh, you know, make sure you feed yourself and don't break anything. All right. No parties. Huh? You know, even though we're not going to be here watching, but no parties. And so as far as that, as far as that goes, that that is salutary neglect that your parents basically go out of town, they leave you there, but you know, you kind of, you kind of liked, uh, you know, just having the house to yourself for a little bit. And so the thing is that the British didn't want to do anything to discourage trade. Like, you know, when it comes down to it, is their goal to, and is their goal to collect taxes or is their goal to encourage trade? And so what we see here is there was a very limited troop presence as well. 
And so the colonies were really left to manage themselves. And also we note that there was the, you know, you did have the French colonies nearby. So before the French Revolution, we look at salutary neglect. It was largely in the non-enforcement of the Navigation Acts and the presence of British troops. Now, as a result of the French Re uh, of the French and Indian War, uh, wrong subject, I always said French, French Revolution, the British national debt went up. And so that is the end of salutary neglect because the British had these ideas that like, look, we had to pay for this money. We had to intervene in the uh, French and Indian War and there we go. So they start to strictly enforce the Navigation Acts. They bring in British troops because they are trying to collect revenue. Okay, so you see here that after the French and Indian War, you've got the Navigation Acts are enforced. You have the end of salutary neglect and the presence of British troops. And so that's when you start to look at this, that when you look at the causes of the American Revolution, they're largely associated with economic factors such as trade and taxes or troops. You know, you've got the three T's, trade, taxes, and troops. Um, so that's something that you'll want to make sure that you understand going uh, going into this. All right. And that's uh, OK. So that's interesting there. We've got an interesting question from James. Would you call the founding fathers libertarians? Now, one thing that we want to note, and we'll get more into that in another broadcast, is we want to understand that the founding, like we don't necessarily want to think about the, <laughs> thank you, Justin. All right. So as far as uh, as far as that goes, uh, let's see. All right. So this this is always great. If I could tell Mr. Burke to give you some extra credit, I think that's up to Mr. Burke. OK, so with that, let's think about this. Would you call the founding fathers libertarians? Now, Jefferson, I think an argument could be made that Jefferson was somebody who was for minimal government interference. He valued laissez faire. He valued um, the protection of civil liberties. Okay, so when you're thinking about like libertarianism, Jefferson is definitely, uh, definitely fits into that. But here's the thing you can't talk about the founding fathers like they're all one group of people who agreed with each other. So when we think about Alexander Hamilton, for example, when we think about Hamilton's report on manufacturers where he says, look, I want to have a protective tariff to encourage manufacturing. I'd like to give subsidies to manufacturers. And so Hamilton, now also remember Hamilton's Federalist Party passed the Alien and Sedition Acts. So when you see that Alexander Hamilton favored a, you know, an expansive government that did plenty to help uh, businesses and, you know, he wanted to, for the government to be involved in the economy. Um, he didn't necessarily believe in the protection of civil liberties in the way that Jefferson did. So, yeah, as far as that goes, we want to note that in the founding generation, there was a lot of conflict about government. And I think that the conflicts that we've always experienced in terms of, you know, in the United States history can all be put back to that original conflict between Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton about how expansive of a government uh, with, uh, you know, how expansive of a government do we, you know, do we want in this, uh, in this country? Okay, so with that, I'm um, going into what I want to do now is I want to go into a, uh, you know, an analysis of what I would call a full credit essay. OK, so I've shown y'all how would we write just a basic essay. OK, but if you're watching this right now, uh, you know, maybe two plus months before the exam, we'll see what the college board has to say tomorrow. Uh, but with that, I think that uh, we'll go ahead and keep uh, keep going into this and uh, see what we've got as far as a full credit uh, essay. All right, so as far as that goes, and again, I will share this entire PDF with y'all, maybe with a slight amendment to the essay that we just looked at, because I would like a little bit more of an intentional uh, use of cause and effect, but sample response A. Now, what I do when we're thinking about complex understanding, okay, so we want to make sure I'm going to go ahead and uh, take a look, make sure we've got a link to the APA push LEQ rubric, okay, because we want to think about how all of these points are scored. If you haven't, uh, if you haven't seen that, um, so with that, hmm, somebody is, uh, 
somebody's gotten uh, gotten uh, gotten ahead of me on that. Let's see here. Um, so as far as that uh, as far as that goes, there we go. The A push. Uh, L Wait, that's my rubric. Okay, let's see. Okay, so it's it's at MadisonPublicSchools.org, but it's uh, okay. So they've got a pretty good SEO operation at Madison Public Schools. But they did uh, they did keep my attribution on there, so I do appreciate that. Okay, they didn't take my name off of it. Um, but anyway, as far as that goes, uh, looking at the A push LEQ rubric. Um, then we're going to see that we've got, uh, you know, we've got contextualization of which we, you know, contextualization can be anywhere in the essay, but we typically, the reader typically expects to see it first thing because that's what most people are doing. On 90% of times when contextualization is being attempted um, willfully, like intentionally, we see it at the very beginning, describing a broader historical context relevant to the prompt. And then the thesis or claim, okay, responding to the prompt with a historically defensible thesis or claim that establishes a line of reasoning, okay? So we see that, establishing a line of reasoning. And then, you know, evidence and support for argument. So we've got two parts here, okay? So first of all, like the three essay that we had provided a few specific examples that were relevant to the prompt. Now, the first evidence point does not necessarily have to be argument driven, okay, or thesis driven. It's just there needs to be some outside evidence that is relevant to the topic of the prompt, as long as there are at least two ways that you show that, hey, I know something that happened here. You explain what the Stamp Act and the Sugar Act are, then there you go. It doesn't necessarily have to be tied to an argument. Now, the second evidence point, okay, when we look at the second point, it supports an argument. Now, nowhere here does it say uh, anything about the volume of evidence, but I think it's kind of understood generally that if you're going to get the second evidence point, it needs to have more than like two pieces of evidence in there. I usually recommend on an LEQ using it least six pieces of good outside evidence that clearly support your argument. Now, one thing to note here, though, for evidence two, it's not primarily based on the volume of evidence. You could have 10 pieces of evidence. And if it doesn't clearly support an argument, if your body paragraphs don't begin with topic sentences, no good. All right. And so then analysis and reasoning, okay? So uses historical reasoning, you make any kind of comparison, you use causation, continuity and change to frame or structure an argument that addresses the prompt, okay? So you've got to use some type of analysis and reasoning there. Now, this one is the so-called unicorn point, complex understanding. Now I'm going to show y'all how to get that. Now on an LEQ, I, Typically, I'll do this either, you know, you would say both similarity and difference, both continuity and change or multiple causes or both causes and effects. And so what I'm going to do here when we look at our, you know, our sample essay here is we're going to think in terms of when I see evaluate the extent to which the American Revolution was caused by disputes over economic policy in the period 1754 to 1776, what we're going to do here is we're going to say that here is economic policy. And then here we're going to introduce that it was also about military policy. Now, another thing we could do is we could go into the effects if we want to be extra, okay? So after the revolution, the articles left the states to regulate their own trade. Also, hesitance to main, maintain a large standing army. Somebody said something about the Third Amendment, which, uh, you know, was a big deal to the people who framed it, but really has not been uh, invoked, uh, you know, very much in our nation's history. So, with that, when we look at the thesis statement, okay, we look at the thesis statement here. Um, let's see, I'm sure, okay, so we'll click that. There we go. Want to make sure everybody can see it. All right, just one more thing down there. Economic policies governing the regulation of trade and taxation without consent were major factors leading to the American Revolution, but were not sufficient to explain why the revolution happened. 
In the end, British military policies pushed the colonies toward independence, okay? So that's what we're seeing there, okay? So basically, they were major factors. So I'm noting that, yes, major factors, but were not sufficient. And so then I'm going to have another paragraph where I talk about military policy. So, you know, this one's going to have three body paragraphs because I'm going for the gold. So one's going to be focused on taxes, another will be focused on trade, and then another one will be focused on military policy. And so now also the contextualization. Now, if we're writing about the American Revolution, salutary neglect is always a good thing here. So before the French and Indian War, the 13 colonies were mostly left alone. Although Parliament passed the Navigation Acts that regulated trade and tax imports, this is not, was known as mercantilism, these policies were not strictly enforced and the colonies traded with whoever offered the lowest prices. This policy was known as salutary neglect. The massive debt that the British government took on defending the colonies in the French and Indian War brought an end to salutary neglect and caused tension between Britain and its North American colonies. Now, notice what I did here is I picked one idea and I dug deep. All right. So thinking, OK, I want to go in and I want to go over basically everything that I know about salutary neglect. And there you go. And it needs to lead to your thesis. OK, that it needs this. There needs to be some type of connection between this, between your contextualization and your thesis statement. Now, notice here as well that a body paragraph should begin with a topic sentence. OK, a topic sentence is making it clear what argument, what, what's going to be argued here. So after the French and Indian War, Parliament passed a series of controversial taxes that angered colonists. The Sugar Act taxed imported sugar. Although it was technically a tax cut, it angered colonists because the tax was actually connected, co I mean collected, when it had not been collected before the French and Indian War. Although colonists were upset, no one disputed Parliament's authority to regulate trade. It was the Stamp Act which raised revenue internally in the colonies through taxing legal documents and paper products that made the colonists especially irate. No taxation without representation was the rallying cry as colonists boycotted British goods and intimidated tax collectors. Colonists felt that the Stamp Act was illegitimate because it had not been ratified by their colonial legislatures. Parliament eventually repealed the Stamp Act, but followed with the Townsend Acts, which taxed paper, paint, lead, glass, and tea. Now, so you see here that everything in this paragraph sticks to that argument about taxes, okay, about the controversial taxes. All of the evidence in this paragraph supports this argument. So when I'm looking for supporting evidence, we see that. Also, we see that these taxes are causing the colonists to get upset. They're called, you know, so then I'm going to go in this paragraph that they're regulating colonial trade. So we bring in the Tea Act, the Sons of Liberty. The first Continental Congress was called as a result of the Intolerable Act. So again, making clear references to cause and effect. Now, this is where when we're thinking about the complex understanding point, which you don't need to do this even to make a five on the exam. But if you're really trying to finesse everything, it's a good idea. And it's just good writing because you are acknowledging a counter argument that the situation is complex and complicated. While the economic disputes brought about mass protests, in the end, it was British military policy that pushed the colonies to revolution. In the 1760s, Parliament passed a quartering act that required the colonies to provide housing for British troops, whose presence in the colonies was no longer necessary after the French were defeated. In 1770, a squad of these British troops fired upon an unruly crowd in Boston that became known as the Boston Massacre. Now, note, if you remember a year, that's great, but you don't necessarily have to remember a year. Like, you you know, you see here where I'm saying in the 1760s. Notice even in this full credit essay, you know, I'm not writing like the Stamp Act passed in 1765 or something like that. If you think about Sugar Act, Stamp Act, Townsend Acts, 1760s, you're pretty good, okay? And so as far as that goes, uh, we see here that 
you know, caused a lot of animosity in Boston, the intolerable acts, okay? So included a stricter quartering act. So that's one thing. A lot of people know that the intolerable acts closed the port of Boston, but this person's showing, look, it's a stricter quartering act and the appointment of a military governor to appoint, do impose martial law. So our biggest things, like people have said here that, you know, you've got the economics, the taxes and the trade, then you've got the troops, and then you've also got, uh, you know, tyranny that you know that the colonists do not have self government that they are being put under a tyrannical regime that is denying them their basic rights to representation it was martial law in massachusetts that led to the battles of lexington and concord the rebellion had officially begun so then at the end of everything i always restate my thesis now i don't rewrite i don't copy my thesis from the first paragraph i'm going to restate it okay so while economic policies played a large role in the american revolution military policies pushed the colonists over the edge toward a declaration of independence. Now then I just throw in, now you don't need to do this. This has already gotten complex understanding without this, but I say something about the Articles of Confederation and how they did not contain any trade regulations. So I bring in an effect that's very relevant that only the states under the Articles had the ability to regulate trade. Now, I'm going to take questions in a little bit. We're going to try to do about the last 10 minutes of this presentation. I want to do Q&A. But before that, I want to show, so get your questions in. If y'all can limit the amount of just uh, extraneous stuff in the chat, but also my colleague at the Bill of Rights Institute is going to uh, you know, make sure that those questions come to my attention. So as far as your questions, take those down. And Haley is going to uh, make sure that, that I see them in the event that uh, there's a lot of idle chatter. So with that, I want to note here that there's another thing that you can do. Now, this is kind of complex, but some of y'all might want to know at least that this is an option, that when we see something like this, what we could do is we could say, actually, when we say evaluate the extent to which the American Revolution was caused by disputes over economic policy, I could say not much. I could say, actually, it's, uh, you know, it's not really, uh, you know, it's not really about that. So, for example, on last year's test, there was a, uh, on last year's exam, there was a prompt that said, like, evaluate the extent to which uh, debates over slavery were responsible for the American Civil War. And you have the option here when somebody's like, well, I don't, uh, I don't think that the Civil War was primarily about slavery. Then you have the option to bring in your argument, um, you know, about states' rights or about economics and make that the primary argument. So they're never telling you that you have to argue a certain way, okay? And so as far as that goes, uh, what I'm going to say in this essay, which is also a full credit essay, that actually these, the economic stuff, secondary causes, that the main cause here was military policy. OK, and so what I do here now note that since I'm going to focus on military policy, I'm not going to use salutary neglect as my uh, as my contextualization that I'm going to when I'm going to get into the glorious revolution of 1688. And when I get into that, then I see here that it was a victory for British constitutional government. The king recognized the authority of the British Parliament to take the lead in making laws. And so I'm going to go here. The liberties of the British people were also listed, and they included the right of law-abiding subjects to bear arms and a prohibition of standing armies during peacetime. And so we see here that, you know, you see this tied here, and then it says here in the end, it was British military policy and restrictions on colonist movement and liberties that sparked the American Revolution. By comparison, economic disputes were relatively insignificant. So I'm going to spend most of my time here arguing about, uh, you know, about military policy. So migration restrictions, the proclamation, um, and then I'm going to go into, uh, you know, into basically this, it's the military policy 
that is the big deal here. So that's something, again, I will share this entire PDF with you um, so that you're able to, you're able to look into that, okay? Um, and so I'm going, you know, we see something about the taxes, but then also you notice that most of this is going to focus on military policy and, you know, it's, you know, when British troops start shooting at colonists, okay? So as far as that goes, uh, you know, some people are asking about, uh, now, um, Dane, what I'm going to say, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, advise you to, uh, you know, the purpose of these AP prep webinars are to prepare you for the exam when, when it is, however it's administered, and all of that stuff, okay? So what we want to, what we want to focus on is content here, but I'm going to advise you to follow MarcoLearning.com on Twitter and Instagram, especially on Instagram. You're welcome to follow me on Instagram too, at Tom Ritchie, and also uh, Bill of Rights Institute will put their own Instagram into the chat, um, you know, when we're looking at, uh, you know, I believe it's at BRI students, okay? So yeah, BRI students, you want to make sure to follow uh, this, which, uh, you know, they're, they're talking about these episodes we've got here. So at BRI students would be a good Instagram account for you to follow. But I'm going to tell you, as far as the announcement, I'm going to be looking to my friends at Marco Learning um, for um, the explanations for that. So we don't want to speculate too much right now about that, because the announcement's going to be made tomorrow. We'll have, you know, we'll have a lot more information. So let's make sure that with that, we're, you know, we're focused, we we can focus on that tomorrow. Okay. So as far as that, we think about the length. Okay. So when we think about the, the now I'll, you know, your question though, Dane, ask that uh, in the Marco Learning broadcast tomorrow. I think that's going to be very relevant to those. Um, so we'll know a lot more tomorrow. Now the DBQ LEQ, the document-based question, you've got, uh, you've got seven sources that are given to you that you have to use. Uh, now you're supposed to bring in your own information as well, but for the LEQ, it's a blank slate. It's just a prompt and you have to supply all of the evidence, okay? So with that, uh, when we think about this, do they have to state before, during, and after? No, the context can be something before. It can be something that's going on at the same time, kind of in the background. Or in some cases, you might have future context. Now, that's rare, but it's, but it's possible. OK, um, so as far as that goes, um, you know, getting both evidence and both analysis points, um, take a look at I've kind of shown you how to get a full credit point. Uh, so when you look at look deeper into that PDF that will be linked into the description, I've got tons of like I've got, I think, five different essays with scoring notes and all of that. OK, now, as far as your LEQ, I think the LEQ should have at least two good body paragraphs. If you're going for full credit, I'd put a third body paragraph in there, but it should be a four, you know, basically a thesis, at minimum, a thesis statement with like two supporting, you know, arguments, and then each supporting argument gets its own paragraph, then restate your thesis. Now, you could do a third body paragraph. So I would say, depending on how much you're trying to get, I would say two to three body paragraphs is going to be uh, is going to be good. And a paragraph typically at least like, you know, four or five sentences. Now, do we need to know specific battles? You need to know specific battles in terms of significance. So Emily, for example, the Battle of Saratoga, that would be important for you to note. Not so much that, you know, Benedict Arnold, uh, you know, rode into battle and his horse was shot out from under him and he shattered his leg. But what we really need to understand is that the American victory at Saratoga ended up uh, getting the French to recognize the United States as an independent country and to give us, uh, you know, to give the United States additional help, okay? And so going into, uh, going into that, um, contextualizing, again, my advice is contextualization at, uh, the very, at the very top here. Now, somebody's asking, um, Henry, you're asking how much storytelling is too much storytelling? So basically, when the story, again, you know, one of my best, you know, one of my, one of my favorite taglines is it's not Harry Potter, okay? So your objective, like narrative-driven writing, just basically looks at this as I'm telling the story beginning to end. My only objective is to tell the story and that's it. I'm just telling a good story. And from there, now the thing is, 
what you need to look at, like each paragraph begins with a topic sentence. If we've got a thesis driven or argument driven type thing here, okay? Um, if we've got a thesis driven or argument driven essay, then we've got the topic sentence and let's think of it as telling little mini stories, okay? So it's like, here's my point I'm trying to make and here are two very small stories that I'm going to tell to support this point, okay? So the story in thesis-driven writing, little stories help to support the thesis rather than one big story that's being told just to tell the story. So the biggest thing is that there is a topic sentence, okay? Now, um, you know, Michael, if we're thinking about this on um, explaining the po social, political, or economic climate of the era, um, sounds to me like that could be contextualization. But then again, um, I'm not going to be able to get too, too deep in, you know, an hour broadcast here, but I am giving you, um, you know, some basics. And also, like I said, once the archive is posted and by tomorrow, I would just recommend going in and uh, you know what, I'll actually, let me, let me go ahead and for the moment, um, you know, I'm going to go ahead and share that with y'all. I'm going to go ahead and share a link um, to that. Now, again, I might uh, edit one of these just a little bit, but, uh, you know, by and large, at least the full credit essays, I still stand by, okay? So I'm going to make sure I'm going to, I'm going to send Haley something here so that we will be able to, let's see, so no, we need to go back here. I'm going to find my actual document in a linked format. I can't share a file with y'all, but I can share a link to a file that I've got online. Okay, so let me just go ahead and share this. And give me just a second. I just want to make sure. Again, I need to look at it and make sure it's a file that I think it is, and it is. Okay, so as far as that goes, um, let's go in here, and I'm going to share that so that y'all can have access to that right now, and y'all don't have to wait for it. All right, so good ways to connect evidence. Uh, do you have to explain the connection deeply or say this led to that? Uh, basically, it's the topic sentence is the key. When you look at those full credit essays, you're going to see that each paragraph and what I've got here. Now, I haven't really been highlighting that, but let me show you what's advantageous about these things that I've got here. Um, that what I haven't really focused on, you notice that as I'm writing, what I've done here is I've written some sample essays for you. And then I've got right here, basically, this is what's being done here. So I kind of give you a play by play of what's going on in, you know, it, in the paragraphs. So you see here, note how I'm saying this is a topic sentence. So what does cause revolutions, revolutions is when people who are accustomed to certain liberties find themselves being disarmed and shot at by their own government. Okay. And so that is what causes revolutions. And so everything here is going to is going to be focused on people being disarmed and shot at by their own government. Okay. That's what we're that's what we're seeing there. So with that, you know, that's why I'm sharing this file with y'all because this file gives, you know, and then also each essay is going to have scoring notes after it. Okay. So I'm basically explaining why this essay got this point. Okay. And then we go on to sample response C of five out of six. And so you can ask, why did this get a five out of six? Now we see the play by play here, but we also can see that, uh, okay, so we've got, okay, it didn't get complex understanding. Um, that it got all of the other points. So you can see that. And then I go down to a three out of six. So you've got several different, uh, you know, different things that you can look at so that you see all of these different, uh, you know, these, these different ways of looking at this. Okay. So with that, let me see if there are any, uh, you know, any last minute, uh, minute questions. Uh, now, as far should you skip? No, no. I would say on your exam, James, never skip a question. Like it's just answer the question. Everything's there in front of you. There's no guessing penalty if you're wrong. Like they don't, they only score your exam, the multiple choice by how many you got right. So if you're not certain about one, pick the answer that you think is most likely to be right and move on. If nothing else, it, keep, it keeps your answer sheet clean because the last thing you want to do is have skipped one and then you forgot to skip one on your answer document. Yeah, I always say do the questions in order, answer them as they come up. 
Okay. Now, can you use DBQ sources in the LEQ? Now, if you mean by DBQ sources documents, you know, yeah, you can refer to a historical document um, in the LEQ. Now, the DBQ is going to be about a different topic than the LEQ prompt. So you won't use documents from the actual DBQ on your exam, but you will use historical documents. Um, when you are writing this, okay? So as far as that goes, hopefully that uh, that has been helpful. Um, again, I've got some lectures on the American Revolution. The lectures are called Parliament Taxes the Colonies um, and then the Road to the American Revolution. Those are some helpful like content lectures. But while we're live here, it's just a good time for me to give y'all um, some, you know, additional uh, information kind of about how to turn what y'all know into something that'll be useful on the test and looking at the overall causes. And then how are we going to tell very small two or three sentence stories in order to provide supporting evidence? And with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it looks like we are at 730. We've been going an hour. And so we are going to be broadcasting uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays for the next few weeks. We're going to be broadcasting Tuesdays and Thursdays at 630 p.m. Eastern here on the Bill of Rights Institute's YouTube channel. So thank you all very much for watching. And I will look forward to seeing you next week. And I believe next week, if I'm not mistaken, that we're going to be focusing on the DBQ and how to do that. So that's going to be something that's going to be helpful to y'all who are, you know, wanting to learn more about how to write for the APUSH exam. So again, ladies and gentlemen, it is always a pleasure and I will see y'all next week.